welcome all and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Robin Dixon and I'm a senior viticulturist at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. In this session, we'll be looking at bouncing back from a hail event. But before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders to anyone who's new to AWRI webinars. If you'd like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button at the um, bottom of the Zoom toolbar. Type in your question and send send and it'll send it through. We'll be holding the Q&A session at the end of the presentations, but feel free to send in the questions at any time. A reminder also that the webinar is being recorded and an, a link to the recording will be emailed out to you um, after the webinar. So for anyone who has just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is bouncing back from a hail event. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Petrie from Saudi. Chris Rogers from Rogers Viticulture and Lee Hazelgrove from Your Viticulture to give you presentations today. We've also got a, a group of people uh, who will be joining us for the panel discussion at the end. So you'll have growers and consultants from the Barossa and from the Riverland and the Murray Valley who have uh, experience with hail recovery. So uh, if you have any regional specific questions, please send them through and we'll have uh, the panel answer those questions for you. So first up, we're going to hear from Dr. Paul Petrie. So Dr. Paul Petrie is a principal scientist in viticulture at Saudi. He leads a viticultural research program aiming to improve the resilience of Australian vineyards. This includes projects developing strategies to better manage dry winters and to understand and manage vintage compression. Prior to starting his role, Paul was a principal research scientist at the AWRI. He has also worked as a member of the AWRI's industry development and support team, focusing on extension and as the national viticulturist for Treasury Wine Estates. Paul grew up helping his parents establish a vineyard in, the, in New Zealand and before moving to Australia for a role at the CS, uh, CSIRO, he completed a PhD on canopy management at Lincoln University. If you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you, Paul. Yeah, Thank I think you. I should be all ready to go. Thank you very much, Robin. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I think my part in today's proceedings is to basically just give a little bit of a, a background of, of how the vine's growth and development responds to a to a hail event. So we just wait and see. Is that... And I hope I'm going to get another slide here. Okay, we, we did manage to do this successfully while we were practicing, but we're not going so well now. Um, Paul, we'll just take over the sharing of your Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. If we can just stay stay there for the moment. So, um, I mean, a hail event. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, it's mechanical damage to a to a vineyard. So we see things like broken shoots. We see defoliation. So some leaves are are, are broken or damaged. Some are removed completely. Um, we can see damage to the inflorescences and the bunches. 
and in some cases when it's it's really bad we can um we can see some some cordon damage and sort of damage to the perennial structures of the vine um i mean that that sounds pretty serious but uh, don't laugh at me here i was um Oh, four or five years ago, I was talking to a, to a viticulture from up in the um, up in Sun, a viticulturist from up in Sunraysia, and he was describing to me a, a hail event, and, and I certainly wasn't getting how bad the damage was. And he sort of looks me in the eye and goes, "Paul, all the kangaroos died." Um, and when you get hail that bad, obviously you're going to have 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 damage to your to your cordons and things. And there is a um, you know, there is quite a, a, a serious vineyard redevelopment that you need to undertake to, to get everything back and going. Um, most of my discussion is going to be around uh, quite substantially less damage than that. The the mechanical damage that we see to hail can be, I mean, it, it's similar in some ways to a, to a frost event um, or to mechanical trimming. Um, you know, a light damage or light mechanical trimming or if somebody um, yeah went, went crazy and, and did some more trimming than they needed to, sort of more serious damage. Could I have the next slide, please? So the other the other issue or the other interaction we see with this damage is the is the timing of the damage. So what what stage of development the vines vines are at, and that'll impact on sort of you know how the how the vines respond, um, what sort of shoot growth we see, where we see whether we see um, you know uh, secondary shoots come away from the basal buds or we see laterals grow. Uh, and what's likely to be, or, or what's there to be damaged. So, you know, are we seeing inflorescence damage? Um, uh, is the potential for impact on flowering or is the um, damage on berries? Um, likewise, we can see, or uh, this then impacts on the on the vine's carbohydrate reserves. So how many, much resources they have to, to sort of redevelop and recover or bounce back after the hail. And um, whether you are, able to if you want to to target or develop a second crop. Oh, can I have the next slide, please? So um, yeah, if we go back to where, where grapevines come from, they're a climbing plant. Um, they've evolved to, you know, climb up the canopy of, of trees or other existing plants. And um, all, all plants have this function, but it's strong, it's strong grapevines, it's called apical dominance. Um, this means that, that the vines focuses its energy onto that growing shoot tip. Um, now I'm moving my pointer, but I, you obviously can't see that. Basically, the you know the, the top the the end of the um, the shoot is is the priority because it wants to grow up, it wants to to seek out light and and garner those more more resources. If we lose that shoot tip um, through to hail damage, um, the vines respond by um, you know growing from from other points. So depending how long or how big that shoot is, you can get a, um, a secondary bud may burst. So if we look at the, the picture on the left of the screen there, we've got sort of the, the bud sitting in the, in the leaf axis and the, the primary bud, which have grown to the, the first shoot of the season, you may get a, a secondary bud come away to, to, to replace that or to grow out. Um, you can also get the um, laterals can come away so they can start to grow and 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 develop a response to the loss of that ship shoot tip or in some cases you can um force a, a primary bud that was on that existing shoot to to grow again but that's a lot less likely because those primary buds are um controlled by a thing called endodormancy which effectively prevents them growing until they've had some um you know receive some chilling over winter they get they're getting ready for the for the next season um so next slide please um, so, uh, as with a lot of these things, the, the damage is often you know, half, half the problem. It's often the, how the vine responds to that damage that's your, your real issue. So, if we lose a, um, a, a shoot at the end of the vine, or the, sorry, the tip of the shoot at the end of the vine, we, we often will get regrowth from, from multiple points. So, instead of having one big shoot, you end up with lots of um, small shoots. Uh, next slide, please. So you get something that, that looks like this. Um, so instead of that, yeah, that one strong shoot that you had initially, you get these, these little shoots growing. Um, why is this a issue a, a problem or why is that a challenging outcome? Because that growth is spread across those shoots. So um, instead of having one proper shoot, you end up with a whole lot of small ones. Um, and that causes problems around um, bud fertility around um, having sufficient shoot growth for, um, for, for pruning. Actually, could I have the, the next slide, please? 
here we go. Um, so, so smaller spurs, and especially if you're using a, a cane or a rod prune system, especially smaller canes, um, which provide, you know, causes issues for, for pruning. Um, we have uh, potentially lower bud fertility because there's not the resources, the carbohydrates to go in and, and grow, grow those strong canes and, and produce fertile buds. And this flows on to reducing the, the return yield the, the following season. And depending on, on how it's managed and how the, how the vine performs, it can uh, impact on, on subsequent seasons after that. So, you know, if you end up with a, a, a very um, bushy, dense canopy of these small shoots, um, then the next year that can impact on your yield. But because there's um, you know, not so much fruit again that next year, you can end up with a, a much more vigorous canopy than you had otherwise. And it sort of almost becomes a, a self-perpetuating thing. Uh, next slide, please. So what do you want? What's an, an ideal response or a, be a better outcome? That's to, um, to manage those vines. So you promote shoot growth, um, you can do this in a, in a number of different ways, but effectively you're, you're targeting or you're wanting um, one or two strong shoots to come from every spur position if you've got a, a, a spur prune vineyard. So this is similar to what you would do when you were, you were pruning. You're basically reducing the number of buds so you get a few strong shoots as opposed to if you had lots of buds and you would get um, a lot more smaller shoots. A um, couple of ways you can do this. Um, you can go through and thin out those um, those laterals or the shoots that are coming away from those the um, the, the damaged uh, the, the base of the damaged shoots from the, the current season, um, and just leave one left and promote for that to grow. Um, or you can come and uh, I suppose have a more a more serious and more drastic outcome. You may go and actually knock all those shoots off, um, and then force the, the secondary um, buds to to come away from the from the cane. Um, or you can do something sort of a little bit in between. You could go through and um, and effectively do a second pruning. So basically prune back to two green spurs or two a two bud spur that's on the green shoot and have that um, have that come away. Now. I've probably got the, the easy job here today. I get to, to describe the problem and talk about the, the options, but I'm very aware that a lot of these options are, are pretty expensive and that they can add a, a cost and not necessarily give you a, a, a dramatically better outcome or not, not guarantee a dramatically better outcome. And so that's why I'm pleased I've got the, um, the industry speakers online with us to, that they can talk a little bit more about sort of, you know, the scenarios and, and where this might be a better options and where they might not be such good options. Um, next slide, please. The, the other um, piece, regardless of whether you actually do some sort of um, active management to the, to the canopy, some sort of pruning or, or trimming or anything, um, you still want to promote those vines to grow nice strong shoots for that, um, for, for, for the crop or to support the crop for the next season. So, um, you know, have a look at that shoot growth rate, you watch it, keep an eye on it. Is the, is the canopy continuing to grow? Has it got as large as you'd like? Um, if it's not, consider um, you know, a, a dose of nitrogen um, just to, to spur things on. Um, and likewise, and I mean, this might seem a bit silly as the, the rain pours again outside my, outside my window up here in the, in the Barossa today, uh, but watch, the, watch your soil moisture and your irrigation. The, um, the profile will dry, um, you know, it can dry quite quickly. And once that shoot growth stops, it's very hard to stimulate it and get it to go again. So you want to keep, a, keep an eye on your, on, on your, soil, moisture, uh, your soil moisture profile and, and be ready to irrigate if you need to. Um, this probably is easier to do or to stimulate and maintain that shoot growth is probably easier to do with outcrop than it is with crop, but that's really more just an observation than anything. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I um, talked briefly about um, you know, what you would do if you were, were trying to get a, a, a second crop or if you said, oh, I'm going to knock those shoots off and try and re-establish a canopy and, and grow. So there, are, um, I mean, this has been... There's not a lot of research directly targeting hail, but there has been some research done where they're looking at um, that sort of double pruning. So effectively pruning intent or a late pruning intentionally to um, delay when the fruit fruit harvest is harvested. Uh, so in this example, this is out of um, the Central Valley in California. So a, um, you know, a Riverland or a Sunraysia type environment, the vines were pruned a, a second time, uh, 25 to 
or 20 to 35 days post flowering. So probably a little bit later than when this hail, or these recent hail events have, have occurred. And this delayed maturity by up to 75 days. Um, I mean, if you were considering you know, this, these sort of actions, you want to be aware that, you know, that's the sort of delay in maturity we can um, expect to see or is potential to occur and look at sort of how much time is left in the season and whether you think you can get the, the, the fruit ripe and, and ready to go within that time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the other potential impact of um, the hail is on on flowering and on on yield um this can be directly through the um you know damage to to flowers or, or damage to um the whole inflorescence but it can also be uh indirect you know if you're there's a reasonable number of, uh, of inflorescences left but you've had some damage to the to the canopy and the and the leaves um the the vines are using the the photosynthates from those leaves to to support flowering um and without them, the flowering is um, potentially not as, as successful. Uh, at this stage of the season, the vines have used a lot of the energies, energy that they store in, their, um, in the trunks and in the roots to grow and develop that canopy. So having the canopy knocked off and knocked back at the moment is, um, you know, it, it's a challenge. The fuel tank is empty for those vines and they're needing to, to try and regroup and, and, and redevelop a new, um, you know, to grow, and grow a new canopy. So it pl places a, a, um, a lot of stress on all, the, all those resources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you can also get the, the physical, the direct damage on the, um, on the berries. Uh, now, depending how many days or weeks ago the, um, the hail came through, this isn't damage, and a lot of you are probably well aware of this, is not necessarily immediately evident. Um, and sometimes it can take a while for the bruising to develop and then the berries to sort of dry out and split. And there's a nice picture there with some sort of those exposed seeds and things like that that you see sometimes when, the, when that damage occurs. Um, fortunately, I think often these berries, um, especially in our, in our fairly dry climate in Australia, those berries will, will shrivel in and dry out and fall off. And that's probably the best thing to happen to them. Um, even when they stay there, the maturity is often delayed. They can carry negative um, flavor characteristics and things with them. And so it's much better to get them out of your, out of your harvest sample. Uh, next slide, please. So just in, in summary, um, the loss of, of, of shoot tips or the removal of, of, of parts or whole shoots often promotes a lot of, of, lot of smaller shoots. And it's these smaller shoots that are issue for the, the management of the, the vines, especially for next season. Um, so, you know, you look at, at different options to try and force the energy into, into fewer shoots so those shoots will, um, will grow better, things like shoot thinning, and look at reviewing your, your inputs, you know, do, do you need an extra dose of nitrogen or something like that to promote that canopy um, development. Uh, the loss of canopy may impact on, on flowering and potential yield, especially at, um, because the, the vine, you know, it's used a lot of its, it, its carbohydrate stores to, to grow that canopy and, and knocking it back takes it, you know, takes it out of it. Um, if you are looking at targeting a, a second crop or, or trying to, you know, effectively fit a, a new season in starting from now, yeah, do you do your sums carefully around am I, you know, how much am I, crop am I likely to get? And do I think it's going to ripen uh, in time to, to, to be viable and sensible for a harvest? Okay, thank you very much, Robin. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Um, now I'd like to introduce Chris Rogers. Chris Rogers grew up on his family vineyard in Eden Valley and has over 30 years of experience in various viticulture roles at Mount Adam, Yalumba and Terramol. Before starting his own consultancy business in 2018, Chris was working as a, the viticulturist and grower liaison for St. Hallett Wines. Chris is a viticulture graduate from Charles Sturt University and is the current chair of Barossa Vine Improvement. Chris also works closely with Barossa and Clare Valley Grape and Wine Associations to provide holistic support to wine growers. Thank you, Chris. I'll let you take over. Sure. You can hear me okay? 
Yes. Yeah. So could you just cycle the slides, Robin? So I'll um, sure help you through it. We might not sync all that well with what you see and what I say, but we'll, we'll work it out. So, um, yeah, so you can jump on to the next slide, please. So you just a quick outline of what I cover. I'll um, talk about, I guess, this HAL event on the 28th of October from a Barossa uh, perspective. Um, you know, we know that HAL is incredibly complicated and there's so many indiscriminate um, outcomes and it's pretty, you know, devastating emotionally and financially. Um, some of what you hear today may have come across as a bit contradictory, but I think it's uh, such a complex one. It's a lot about the context. Um, so, yeah, talk a bit about the observations in Barossa, some of the decision-making processes as I've seen them, uh, some post-management, I guess, um, options, post-event options, and a couple of take-home messages. So I guess I've seen my fair share of how damage uh, growing up in Eden Valley. Um, so, uh, as I said, whilst it'll be quite Barossa-centric, hopefully there's something useful uh, for, for other regions. So um, you want to jump to the next slide? So yeah, certainly um, severe hailstorm events like this one are pretty uncommon in the Brossom. Um, and this particular one, um, that's a slide I'll sort of cover, give you a quick idea, it cut a pretty big wide and long track through the Barossa region from Barossa Valley in the west to over the range to part of Eden Valley. So this, this sort of size band, if you like, has yeah, never been seen before. We've had hailstorms, but they're nearly always very isolated. Um, and talking to Perza at, at a meeting this morning, they said these recent events across, you know, Riverland, um, parts of Adelaide Hills, Barossa, over two different events, and something like 24 LGAs that have been affected. So it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, the interesting thing with this storm in Barossa, unlike the Riverland one on last Saturday, was the wind speeds were actually very low at the time the hail fell. Um, so that, I think, has made quite a big difference to the damage we've seen. And but we did get a really strong gust of wind late in the day, which was a bit of insult to injury for a few people. I mean, shoots that then just blew away. Um, but it, that wasn't the major part. Um, and the duration was relatively short compared to some. Um, and obviously, how diameter as always varies massively. Uh, there were, were some really big ones, um, but you know, generally sort of in that five to 15 millimeter diameter. Uh, if you just jump to the next slide. Um, Robin, oops, sorry, oh, yeah, and there was rain as well. So this, uh, these sort of images we certainly don't like seeing on a mobile phone when we're um, out this time of the year. That doesn't really depict the track that I mentioned across the Barossa very well, but it gives you an idea of the intensity that we all saw, um, which is pretty scary. So um, I'm going to pop on to the next slide. So, yeah, just talking through some of the damage types we saw, I think um, you can appreciate the polls covered a lot of that, what can happen. Um, and the EOS stage for us was obviously earlier than the Riverland one, sort of in that 11 to 18, um, where we saw those, you know, large hailstones, a longer duration, we saw some pretty serious damage. Whilst not common, sometimes we saw canes damaged, um, especially if there wasn't a lot of canopy over it. Um, and yeah, and I guess the lower wind speed of the sea, we didn't see that leaf shredding, but we've certainly seen a lot of leaf bruising. Um, and by far, you know, the worst effect is Shiraz, um, came pruned, very open, exposed, and that north-south reorientation having come from the west. Uh, you'll see some photos later. It's pretty bad in some cases. Um, yeah, Natara and Tipranello got knocked around pretty badly. Grenache, on the other hand, um, was remarkably resilient with its kind of shingled canopy. Um, and, you know, some Cabernet around that was very late pruned. It really didn't show a lot of damage, a bit of damage of Riesling, but generally reasonably resilient. Uh, next slide. So this is just some tips on assessing hailstorm damage. Uh, certainly not a fun thing, um, pretty emotional. Um, but I think it's really important when you're making decisions, especially if you're going to make a major decision, um, you really need to not only know where all the damage is, the type of damage, the depth and the canes, uh, how variable it is across your vineyard. Um, yeah, sometimes it's good to go out and have a look initially. It's a bit daunting, but as everyone will tell you, don't start making quick decisions unless it's absolutely clear cut because you will see uh, more damage expression as, as the days roll by. 
and in some cases we're going to be assessing damage all the way through to uh, harvest and beyond. Um, and I said, yeah, I think it's really important to get a handle on the variation across your vineyard. Um, some young vines have been quite badly damaged. So um, I'll show you some examples later there. Um, and, and I guess it is very emotional doing this process. So sometimes it's good to um, try and remove that or get some outside help uh, on the next slide. And so you, I think these are just obvious but important things to keep in the back of your mind when you start making decisions. You know, consider the inherent big of the vineyard, the variety, how it's going to respond. I think it's really important to think about what are the goals of your vineyard? Uh, can you still achieve them? Sometimes you will. Uh, other times you've got to start thinking, well, okay, I've got to um, change course and, and understand what those options are. Um, and I guess this will be make a bit more sense as I talk through my other slides. It's helpful sometimes to really rank in your mind if you're going to really start making changes. What what are you? What's most important? Is absolutely crop the most important about everything, or is it actually about uh, correcting or remediating your pruning structure? What are your quality goals? If you're you know, a small producer, and you must make super high quality wine that has a big bearing uh, versus a large commercial. And also, you know, what's the future of the vineyard, which should have relevance um, and a point I'll make a bit later. Um, and obviously there are some limitations. Cost, getting a labour to do the work, uh, very difficult. And um, and obviously talk with everyone, family, business partners, wineries, winemakers. Um, when you're making a major decision, then everybody needs to be in the room. Um, you can jump the next slide, Robin. That's, uh, Paul's already covered that. That's really just the, the bud structures. Uh, I think knowing how vines respond is really important. So, yeah, we'll jump to some management options. Um, I guess I just, you can pop all three points on the side of it, Robin. So uh, it's a probably a bleeding obvious one, but in really severe cases, you know, actually first thing you need to do is, is the site safe. You don't want people coming on where there's hazards or getting involved and that kind of thing. Um, sometimes that's severe, sometimes it's not problematic. Uh, you know, good farm by security is important at any time. Botrytis risk, I won't talk a lot about this. Um, this is highly dependent on the circumstances, the variety, dare I say, risk perception. Um, the, the quite often here, the generic advice, you must apply a botrytis side immediately after damage. I think that is very situation dependent. Um, there you know, are other issues such as narrow wind of opportunity of use now, as people know, and some products simply aren't available. So I guess I'd say think about that very holistically. Um, in a dry climate like Barossa, um, there's nothing to say we're going to get a wet vintage per se. Um, risk now doesn't necessarily mean we get risk um, at the fruit, but there will be scenarios with dense canopies and um, you know, a lot of debris because the tritus will grow on dead tissue that might be a problem later. Um, and I guess if people really want to get out there, I know this is probably irrelevant now, we are past this point, but if you want to protect the shoots and the leaves from botrytis, well, coverage is, is critical and it's not as easy as it looks. Um, certainly talk to your great purchase or winemaker about products. And the, the other one's often talked about is trunk disease risk in terms of wounds on the trunk or permanent parts of the vine. Is that a... Uh, a pathogen entry potentially. I haven't seen too much in the Barossa's case. We didn't get massive high, high you know, wind uh, jagged hail, but it, it is potentially uh, a risk, um, which I'll touch on later with shoot removal. So, uh, yeah, pop on the next slide. Uh, maybe just run them all out. So, these are just some things that I think come to mind about um, the decisions you might make in that first week or so. Um, I'll talk to this in a moment. The whole shoot removal is a pretty radical one, and there are some people who've done it, um, and uh, there's certainly situations it's merited, uh, but there are others it's certainly not. So um, I can't give you a black and white answer on that, but I'll show you a few examples where I think it's very effective. Poly products, um, yeah, they, I guess there are some things that will help, you know, the kelp seaweed products, some other certainly micronutrients can help. But uh, I guess there are some products out there that probably make occasionally make some grandiose claims. Some of them, some of them probably work. All I'd say is, uh, you know, if people are promoting and where, where are the results, where are the trials on those. Um, fungal diseases, um, down in Milgi sometimes can be a risk, but uh, in the Barossa's case, it's it, very unlikely unless we had long ground wetness. 
And I guess, that, you know, in some cases it will be carry on as normal. There's certainly some vineyards with damage that don't merit any major change. But there are also some, I would say, putting the vineyard into what I call tech caretaker mode is merited. And that might be it's just not worth spending the money on doing any repatriation. It might be the crop is very, very small. There are so may not even have a home. Um, it might be a case of keeping that vineyard in acceptable uh, health. Uh, bring it back online in 23. Or the other one is there may be a vineyard where it was due for restructuring, meaning cutting off to a remediate uh, trunk disease. Well, maybe it's just time to bring that forward. And there may even be some vineyards out there where they were probably going to be on the chopping block. Uh, maybe it's time just to pull the pin on them totally. So it, I know that sounds harsh, but sometimes these things force our hand. Uh, next um, slide, please. So I won't spend a lot of time on these. I haven't got a point to show, but I guess this is just an example. Of some of the damage we've seen came through in Shiraz, top left, uh, very variable damage to the vine, but there's really not much left there. Uh, the one on the right is a classic case of extreme damage, um, came through in Shiraz. Uh, that's, you know, that's 100% demolished. Bottom left is Mataro. We saw quite a bit of damage in Mataro, really stiff upward shoots, you know, leaves, bunches torn off. And the one on the right is, is right out the extreme uh, where the tail virtually pruned the vineyard. Uh, mind you, this grower is actually going to go back and prune that as we speak. Um, next slide. So this is an example where um, the grower decided to do the full shoot removal. The, in the foreground is a, is a vine, uh, how it looked before, um, straight after the hail. A um, bit hard to see merely, but very severe shoot damage. All short shoots, pretty much crops all gone. All it would have done is made a lot of laterals. And the, the primary goal that's set up there really is re-establishing pruning structure. They want to actually get it to spur pruning um, next year. Hopefully, uh, plus it still has some good cane growth from the centre to replace damaged canes. Um, and so I guess, and then the second goal um, is basically making sure what crop does come off of this is viable and it's uniform. So uh, the bottom left, I guess, I'll touch on this a little bit later, is um, I guess a shoot that's been cut off. The bottom right is an example where breaking out won't always necessarily remove the secondary or tertiary but that shoot may not be strong enough to support itself. So uh, next slide. So here's an uh, example where the, again, it's come back to the goals of the vineyard. The, the grower really wanted to make sure they could cane prune this vineyard next year. If they left that vine on the left, as you see it, they would have had great difficulty getting good canes to do that. Um, so on the left is before, or after the hull, I should say, on the right is after hand, um, hand breakout. Uh, bottom left photo is an example of obviously how not to do it. That may or may not remove the secondary or tertiary, um, whereas on the right, whether you break it in such a way by hand, you, you keep the basal, or you, you actually do it by hand uh, with a pair of snips or slow. Um, I do work with Mandy Marder at Vine Scout. We, uh, this particular vineyard, we did a little bit of work looking at bud fruitfulness with um, cane and spur where we broke it out uh, severely, you might say, um, versus cut it with snips. And in the uh, cane print example, if, if that thing happened on the bottom left, uh, the, you know, the fruitfulness that we're left with is only about 30% of what it would have been otherwise cutting it. Um, spur prune, you tend to have a lot more buds um, hidden away. Um, and that scenario is probably still 60%. So the point is how you do that removal is really important. Next slide. Um, so this, in this uh, case, I'm not promoting any of these. This was actually shoot removal by machine harvester. Um, and it actually worked pretty well. You can still see some remnant shoots on the right there in that right photo. Uh, but on the left, um, again, it, um, the, the grower didn't want a big uh, bottle brush at the end of the season and that inability to, to uh, to you know to prune properly so it was done very quickly a few days later um, and it can work but a very short window um, those shoots to get quite firm and will not break out properly i'll just slide down to the next few of them um, so machine pruner is used by some people um, difficult to get low enough 
might require follow-up. Um, a disbudding brush, I've not seen it done, but it, it's not inconceivable. The chemical treatment, uh, I know people have had some success with this on frost remediation um, to burn off the shoots with uh, herbicide. Um, can work, but uh, as I said, be very, really, really careful about how you go about these. Um, they can work, but pretty narrow uh, window of opportunity. So next slide. A uh, quick example of young vine management, that young vine on the left, first crop, canes laid down, pretty demolished, uh, wasn't going to produce any, you know, any worthy crop. Um, and the grower wanted, wants to, uh, those top canes in the wire pretty damaged. So it's about breaking everything out, forcing new canes from the crown, and then obviously uh, wrapping down new canes. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to leave a little bit of leaf around the centre just to drive early growth, and then you can cut it off later. Next slide. Um, yeah, flip through these. So really, I guess it's from, from sort of here on in, if you like, um, assessing the vineyard. Post-fruit set is going to be a crucial period. Uh, obviously, Riverlands, uh, we're all past that. Um, Barossa, we're sort of just getting into flowering now in many varieties. Um, I think there'll be a lot of weight. See um, really your one maker, and then obviously um, just before harvest and again um, post harvest. Pest and disease control. Uh, it's going to be crucial to get good powder and energy protection on those. You know that slush growth. So the thinning I've touched on. Um, water nutrition management is always a, can be a bit binary, but it shouldn't be. Uh, when I say caution and nitrogen, I'm not for one moment. I say do not apply, but uh, we also need to be very careful about there's some situations that will do more harm than good. Um, there's certainly no point pouring it on straight after the hull damage. The vine will not utilise it. Um, but depending on what you want to achieve, um, that's where you need to think carefully. Uh, some vines have very good health and will bounce back and really won't need a lot. Uh, the hand removal of green bunches, I think that's only probably realistic in a very high-end, high-quality target, or it may, in some cases, be the difference of having that crop merchantable. Um, harvest management, um, there'd be scenarios where we might, uh, a grower might machine harvest one part different to the other, whether that's separate rows or whether that's you know, swapping bin trailers. Hand harvesting, you know, I guess it just depends uh, on the cost and the economics and so forth. And I guess post-harvest management, obviously, binds if they are a bit diminished, um, looking after them post-harvest, build up the reserves is really important for next year. And I think we're going to have some big decisions to make come pruning time. Uh, looking at your wood quality, where you're going to get it from. Um, and I think certainly in some cases, it'd be good to get the bud fruit from this checked out because primary bud necrosis will certainly be a problem in, in some cases. So, uh, yeah, um, move on to the next slide. What I've done here, just really quickly, uh, to try and help people uh, with the local board, and I've kind of sort of classified severe, which you saw earlier, this is sort of in that mid-range, potentially some of the most difficult to manage. Um, and a lot of shoot tip damage on the left, uh, quite battered canopies. The bottom right is also got some trunk disease. Um, so you need to really think carefully about all the issues here. Um, some are gonna have more issues with mob. Uh, next slide. But also there's some scenarios where Arguably, the damage in relative terms is actually quite low. Probably don't really need to do a great deal. The bottom left, albeit old vine, looks a bit ratty, is Grenache, and it, it's held up remarkably well. The top left, I think there's damage on that top cane versus the spur. I think the variability of maturity is going to be a bit more of a problem. Um, the canopy architecture on some of these bottom right, you know, um, could get a bit messy. Um, you know, more upright varieties will probably be okay, but Shiraz being pretty droopy, the canopy, you know, could get quite congested and sort of umbrella over. Um, next slide. This is just a quick example when people are assessing vineyard. You look from one side, it uh, looks pretty ordinary. You look from the other in the leaf condition and the health is very good. So we need to sort of be, uh, just don't look at the bad stuff. So next slide. This is something I think that's obviously going to be concerning. There's some shoot damage in some cases, a lot of leaf removal. If we haven't got a lot of leaf, certainly not opposite the bunch. Um, we've got bunch bruising top left. Fruit set 
is not going to be good. There's not going to be enough carbohydrate energy to drive that process. So I guess time will tell on that one. And then from there, it'll be probably big decision time. So next slide. This is just an example in Eden Valley, uh, not to suggest this, this would happen. This was actually a house storm in November 2014 in an old Rhine vineyard that had fibrous of caught on decline, Utipa. Uh, this was more of a small, high, high velocity sort of um, shredded canopy, but you can see the cane damage on the right. And then the, the unfortunate part, the bottom right picture, then you can see a lot, a huge amount of maturity variability across the bunch. Um, and that vineyard also had a lot of variability from vine to vine. This particular, I guess, scenario was uh, someone wanting it for their own wine and who had a high-end target and they just didn't pick it. It was just not worth it. Um, they hadn't actually spent any extra money on it, but I guess they ran, ran with it and then pulled the pin um, at the end. So, and that sometimes might be what it comes to. So, so um, yeah, to wrap up to the last slide or second last slide, just some take home messages. You could just go to the next one, pop them all out. I guess, obviously, just keep assessing. Um, look at that one, yep. Um, really think about your priorities all the way through. Uh, have a plan. Um, regular communication is absolutely crucial with everyone involved. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, my thing that's quite severe health damage, vines have got very good recovery capacity in terms of their physical or their growth recovery. And, you know, uh, key point, look after yourself as well. Talk with talk with friends, neighbours, all the support you've got. Um, and you need to recover too as, as, a, as a, you know, enterprise owner or grower or um, or one maker. So uh, just on the last slide, Robin. So I guess um, it's it's worth reaching out. The believe me, there's actually quite a lot of support mechanisms through primary industries and others. So if you're not aware of these, uh, first stop would be your local uh, regional association, or just get on the uh, PERSA um, recovery hotline. You'd be probably surprised what support is available out there to support you from a business point of view. So uh, I'd yeah, really encourage that. If there's federal or state funding available, don't hesitate to use it. It's there for everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, and just the last slide, just a few acknowledgements. Um, I uh, yeah, uh, appreciate the support of Russell Grape and Wine Association with a lot of work I do. Uh, work with Mandy Marta does a lot of the bud dissection work. Um, we all think might be busy next winter. Um, and, Really appreciate all the support and conversations with Brosser growers and winemakers and um, the opportunity to give this presentation. Thanks, Robin. Oh, that was wonderful, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, it was great to uh, see examples of different levels of, of damage and um, to get your view on um, how growers um, should consider um, managing the, the damage on a block by block basis. Um, now I'd like to introduce Lee Hazelgrove. Lee Hazelgrove is a viticulturist at Swinney Vineyards in Great Southern Western Australia. Lee is well connected throughout the Western Australian wine industry and is sought out for his thought, leadership in viticulture and innovation. He is respected by the wine writer community and this unique relationship has enabled him to raise the awareness of viticultural practices in relation to wine style and quality. Lee provides innovative engineering solutions to his clientele and demonstrates a deep understanding and commitment to viticultural innovation. Lee is the current chair of Wines of Western Australia Technical Committee and is a member of the Great Southern Wine Industry Association. Um, Lee is also uh, our Viticulturist of the Year <laughs> and has um, had first-hand experience with hail damage back in 2014. So thank you so much, Lee, for coming on to share your insights and learnings from, from 2014. I'll hand over to you. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I should say. Um, I'm in Western Australia. Thanks for the introduction, Robin. Um, um, I know how all of you will be feeling. Uh, we went through one of these exercises or these events um, back in 2014. Um, I've been in viticulture a long time as well, and I thought the way 
Chris's presentation described the situation was was very very good, and I think you know historically I'd seen partial hail damage across sections of vineyards, but this particular event that we experienced in Franklin um, in October October the twentieth was extremely widespread where the whole region was affected essentially. Um, so over a thousand hectares affected. Um, the event was very severe um, and in a way that that was helpful because it pretty much removed almost all the green tissue that we were that we were dealing with. So we started with um, 15 or 20 minutes of extremely strong winds uh, from the west and, and very large hail. Some of it on the screen there now. Um, and then we had sort of a period of calm where we, uh, it was late afternoon, we, we, um, we sort of collected ourselves a little bit and the, we thought the storm had passed. And then essentially the, the storm cloud um, had, had turned and then we had another 10 or 15 minutes of extremely strong wind and hail from the east. So basically almost all of our vines are, are trellised in a north-south direction. So they were buffeted extremely hard from both sides. So yeah, we were completely shredded. Um, there was really no green tissue left on the vines. And in a way that did make some of our decisions a little bit easier. There's a picture of uh, the lawn, what used to be lawn and roses from my house. Um, and one of my kids, uh, toys that we used as a sled there for a, for a few hours for some tobogganing. Um, yeah, it's a bit confronting actually looking back at these images because, uh, yeah, it was a pretty confronting event. So, um, you know, one of the advantages of losing almost all the green tissue on the vineyard was that the decisions were somewhat easier. I mean, all the crop was gone. It was a straightforward case of 100% crop loss. There was not really anything left on the whole 160 hectares that I was managing. Um, so that allowed us to think, well, the crop's gone. It's the 20th of October. Trying to recover crop at that stage of the season in a region like Franklin River, which is probably slightly cooler than the Barossa. Um, biologically effective degree days of about 1500. Um, a wide range of varieties and a lot of them ripening in you know, mid to late April in a normal year. So we, we decided quite early that pursuing crop was probably not, it was, it was just unwarranted. Um, and I've been uncertain about whether to mention this point because it might, um, it might change people's perception of the presentation, but I will, I will point out that we were 100% insured um, and I'm not saying that to brag in any way. I just, I just thought I'd make the point that it did allow us to think in a medium to longer term way about what, how we were going to approach the vineyard, particularly with thinking about the following season um, and the future season. So we pretty much moved on quite quickly from what to do for that growing season. And we started to think about vintage 15 and beyond quite quickly. Um, so, I'll just describe them. We have a whole range of pruning systems. We have um, we have bush vines. We have I think we have about fourteen different varieties. We had um, unilateral spur prune cordons, like you can see on that previous slide. Um, we had cane prune vines, and I guess at that stage of our you know management and, and redevelopment of that property. Um, Conversion, converting to cane pruning was something we were well underway. We might stay on this slide for a little while, Robin, please. Um, so we took the view that on the vines that we've wanted to, you know, convert to canes, you know, normally you wouldn't do this in the middle of October, but um, we thought, well, we will. So we converted about 30 hectares of spur pruning cabernet to cane pruning um, by taking off those those unilateral cordons. And if I had my time again and I had any had an event like that and spur prune vines I wanted to convert to cane, it was a it was a great 
it was a very good thing to do. Um, it basically took any crop out of the system that might have responded or, or recovered, which we didn't want. Um, and it allowed the vines to pretty much have a year off growing canes and that prepared them pretty well for, for V15. Um, that certainly worked very well for us, but there was other context around why we made those decisions. Um, Cabernet really needs to be cane pruned in, in that region. And those cordons were 20 years old and time to, to replace them. So we, we took the opportunity to the hell provided, I guess. Um, I think the other thing we did well that, that I'd do again was any of the cane prune vines, we we head pruned those vines in the in the week or two after the hail event. And basically that um, eliminated any crop, uh, which suited our objectives because we were focused very much on, on V15. Um, and it allowed the vines to grow strong productive canes from, from where we wanted them, you know, from the Crown region. So, so that worked very well for us. Um, yeah, I thought Chris's points about not overreacting with, with fertiliser and water were very, very sensible. And um, I think, yeah, the, the vines don't look like they do because they're short of nitrogen or, or water. They look like that because of the, the physical damage they've experienced. So don't overreact. Um, certainly if you're in premium territory, um, steady at the wheel, I think, is a, is a sound way to go. Probably different for the Riverland, but um, that's, um, I won't delve into those topics or that region so much. I'll just talk about how, how we approached it. Um, one of the things we did do that I don't think worked very well for us was we, we did reprune some of our spur prune cordons um, with the aim, aim of trying to get renewal wood from from the right position, what like fruitful renewal wood from from down near the cordon. I think one of our neighbours at the Alcumi Wine Company they they did the pruning pretty much straight away, like two or three days after the event. They started their spur pruning program, and that that worked very well. Um, they the vines seemed to grow quite evenly. Um, we waited about three weeks before we got that sort of decision out of ourselves and and I think that was not a good idea because the vines really stunted and they 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 took a long time for that second bud burst. Um, so if you're going to do that, um, well, you, you might have missed the boat, um, I suggest. Um, our bush vines, um, I'm not sure, Robin, could we go back to one of those pictures of the bush vines? Is that possible? I think in people who are growing bush vines, um, you know, it's, it's all about the structure in a bush vine. And so I think we're looking at Grenache here. We have uh, Mouved and Tempranillo also on, on, on bush vines, but we reprune these vines as well. And again, we didn't prune, reprune them for crop, we reprune them for, for structure. Um, and essentially the hail had probably taken care of the majority of the pruning anyway. Um, as you can see, there's there's no real green tissue, but but like Paul pointed out in his first presentation, um, there is going to be a, a multi multitude of shoots that emerge from those those um, those lateral shoot positions and um, we wanted to remove we wanted to eliminate that and just keep the structure of the line you know on the same sort of um, trajectory as as what we were you know looking at you know in the earlier version of the pruning so i think i think we've we had a lot of different training systems and i think we reacted we um we manage those those different training systems quite differently i think chris made some really good points about there's no simple there's no simple answers to um to how to to make decisions in this process it's um it's really a, a case by case basis. Um, this would be a Shiraz vine that um, where we would have repruned. Um, no, it's not repruned, but um, that's hail pruned. But some of those we converted to um, to canes, given that you know, given that opportunity that we we, we took to um, 
we wanted to be on canes on a proportion of our Shiraz and Cabernet, so we took the opportunity to head in that direction. Um, one very difficult situation we had was we had started grafting and we had a 10 hectare grafting program underway. Um, we had basically been grafting that, that day and you know, those vines were severely damaged, um, both the grafts and the, uh, all of the top, the top growth was removed. So these vines have experienced probably over hundred millimeters of, of moisture uh, in the ground, um, transpirational surface area completely eliminated by the hail. You've got grafts that are flooding, um, really difficult time to manage. I'm not sure whether there's much grafting uh, going on um, in the region, but um, that was a hard time. We managed to get those grafts to, um, to take through um, basically making evacuation cuts on the trunk just to release the hydraulic pressure. We had to do that three or four times. Um, they were just, you know, the grass were just flooding, but um, it was pretty pleasing to be able to recover those grafts because we'd done a fair, done a fair bit on that particular, uh, in that particular year. Um, so I think, probably just talked about how how we approach the situation you know in the franklin river region you know we're in the middle of a, a four or five year turnaround from a vineyard that had been um you know supplying a single company and we were looking to diversify that um and and sort of we felt that trying to recover crop in a year when we probably weren't going to produce the best quality ever. anyway. We took that decision pretty early, um, yeah, not to try and recover crop and, and be, you know, maybe become known for some lesser quality fruit. Um, so I guess we were able to think longer term about how, how we would approach our, our in-season management to, um, you know, to position the vineyard for the longer term. And I know not everybody has has that opportunity um but i just thought i'd describe that because it does i think there's some blocks where you know head pruning will probably be relevant um even though it feels like a fairly aggressive thing to do but i suspect that there'll be some blocks that that would be probably the best thing for them um i'll leave others to comment on you know water and nutrients and and other inputs but um yeah Structurally, that's we spent most of our time on structure and recovery of uh, fruitful pruning wood, and I think, yeah, you know, that served us pretty well. We were we were back in the game um, from a productivity point of view from from V fifteen. So, so yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to prepare a, a, a better presentation than that, and you've just had a bit of um, a bit of a brain dump from uh, six or seven years ago. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take questions further through the program. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, thank you for sharing your uh, insights. Um, now I'd like to um, invite Paul and Chris to rejoin us for the Q&A session. And um, Lee, if you can stay on as well. And we also have um, a few other um, industry people joining us for the Q&A session. So we've got uh, Dylan Griggs, Steve Schiller, Ian McRae, Alf Sapupo and Brenton from um, so Alf is a consultant, Alf and Brenton are both consultants from uh, the Murray Valley uh, who have worked with uh, growers, particularly in after the 2014 um, hail. So they've got um, insights into um, hail recovery in um, the inland irrigated regions. We also have Ian McRae, he's joining us. He's a, um, an accolade viticulturist. He has um, also been um, providing growers uh, in the Riverland region with advice on how to recover from hail. Uh, we also have um, 
Uh, Dylan Griggs, he's here. He's a consultant from the Barossa. He has clients in the Barossa that he has been working on um, after the recent hail hailstorm. He um, is also a postdoc researcher for the University of Adelaide. And he also has clients in the Adelaide Hills, Clare, WA, Victor Victoria, Tassie and Spain, lucky thing. Um, and we also have Steve Schiller here. Steve is a very innovative grower um, and he's been trialling some really interesting um, techniques to ma manage hail damage in um, his vineyard and the vineyards of other Barossa growers. So super keen to hear um, from Steve as well. So thank you all for joining us. We've got some questions that have come through. Um, so this one, I'll start off um, asking Paul to answer this question and then I'll open it up to um, perhaps uh, Dylan uh, and Chris, I'd like your uh, thoughts on this. So how will damage to rat canes potentially affect this season's growth? Will this impact in following years if obliged to spur prune next season? So Paul. Thanks, Robin. Okay, so um, the damage, I mean, it depends how much there is and how, how, how severe it is. Um, there is potential that that damage will weaken those canes. If you're intending to um, spur prune and spur prune permanently, then, or leave that, that those canes then become a permanent cordon. I suppose there's a concern that um, yeah that the, the damage will, will be uh, a source of permanent weakness. That something might break later, or that the um, it'll uh, disrupt the vascular flow for those vines, and and their performance might be affected. If you're looking and saying, oh, the, the cane is there, and I may spend pruning next year as a contingency, but I'd return to cane pruning the season following. Um, yeah, the, I suppose there's a, there's a risk, but I don't know how great that is. It's hard to say how great that risk is without looking at the damage. Um, sorry, I probably haven't done a very good job of answering that. It's, it's really hard to know without sort of seeing it. Yeah, so thank you. So Dylan, from what you have um, seen in the Barossa um, over the last couple of um, weeks, what are your thoughts on um, how growth will be affected this season on cane pruned vines? Thanks, Robin. I think the question, because they say they were obliged to spur prune, they weren't intending to spur prune, so they'll probably revert back to cane or rod. Um, from what I've seen, some of the damage now that the um, the canes that are on the wire are starting to expand in diameter um, because we're getting closer to flowering. They're starting to split quite a lot. So there's potentially restricted sap flow that may occur, but also the obligation to spur prune because you don't have um, useful canes means that you'll be spurring potentially off of shoots that have undergrown rapid lateral growth. So if you do have those uh, antlers or bushy uh, shoots with a lot of laterals, those laterals will be sucking a lot of energy from those buds that you'll be relying on for next year's fruit load. So the potential for um, high incidences of PDN um, are a real risk. So you should also consider that as well as the sap flow when you're um, having a look at bud numbers or pruning. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you. And Chris, did you have anything to add just from your observations out there this year? Um, probably only one point. I think Paul, you did a good job actually, and, and Dylan as well. Um, the only thing I'd say, I, it, it's a very practical decision. If there's damage just before that bud, that growing point, that's going to be a temporary spur, that's going to be much worse than you know, one little dent between an internode. The other one will be whether you've got any foliage support. If you've got an unpositioned canopy, um, as we know, you get canopy roll, you get cane twisting or rotation. Uh, they will probably break with fruit load in that following year in 23. But if you can support them with, with a catch wire, foliage wire or whatever, you may mitigate that. You just have to accept that it ain't going to be perfect um, and you just have to make that call and get the best you can out of it. And I totally take dollars, but I think that question is saying it's only going to be temporary. You just have to live with what won't be perfect. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you. Um, now, just to bring a bit of context um, into things for the for the Riverland growers. So, um, in the Riverland, they have had two hail events. The first one um, caused um, uh, variability. Well, there's um, variability in the amount of damage that um, was um, caused, but then they had a second event that has um, targeted um, one specific region of the Riverland. Ian, can you just talk to us about uh, what sort of damage uh, was um, 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 experienced after the first event and then what you saw after the second event um, and perhaps if you could touch on the different pruning types and how um, the damage differs depending on how you pruned in the Riverland. Thank you, Ian. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. good, good. Um, the first, um, the first uh, hail event was the same one that impacted the, the Barossa uh, in late October. And it was, fairly, it was a fairly minor event as far as the area that actually impacted. It was tended to be just to the south of Loxton. Um, so it didn't enter large areas of the um, grape growing uh, areas of the Riverland. So it was, so it was fairly minor impact uh, as far as uh, viticulture was co uh, concerned. Of course, it uh, impacted badly on other crops, uh, such as almonds and citrus uh, in that area, but uh, um, relatively minor damage. Uh, the second event that occurred uh, last Saturday was uh, a much more severe event. Uh, it was, again, highly restricted, uh, swept through a narrow belt uh, from the west through the central areas of the Riverland um, and petered out by about uh, the time it got to Berry. The hail petered out, I mean, uh, the, uh, the winds were absolutely um, uh, just uh, cyclonic in, in, in uh, their speeds. And, and I think you've probably seen the damage to the, the main street of uh, Renmark with uh, trees down, power lines down, uh, but they actually didn't uh, get hail uh, of any significance uh, with that wind. So a lot of our damage was hail, but uh, more widespread was uh, damage from just the, the severe winds that we had. Um, we've, it, it, uh, we've got about um, Accolade CCW and probably uh, um, we've had about um, 130 growers who have had uh, significant uh, or, or damage of some significance. Um, we've done yield estimates, uh, uh, yield loss estimates um, to this point. We haven't uh, assessed every every vineyard um, or every patch yet, but we'll get around to that. I suppose the main, it was such a narrow uh, strip that uh, did the damage and within that area, within that zone, um, some of the damage was up to, well, we've assessed at 70 to 80 percent of the crop has been removed. Um, not quite as severe as uh, the hail we experienced a couple of uh, a couple of years ago in 2019, uh, but still uh, up to 70 or 80 percent uh, damage. As as mentioned by Chris, um, our nor our north south rows were impacted most, um, taking the full brunt of the, uh, the storm that came in uh, from the west and travelling east. Um, uh, Shiraz, of course, uh, being fairly tender um, and sappy at the time, uh, a lot of uh, damage to uh, shoots, uh, shoots broken off. Um, and uh, not so much damage on east-west rows as, uh, as the storm tended to pass uh, along the rows, not impacting directly the bunches they did for the north-south rows. So, um, uh, so we're just assessing the recovery. We're fairly experienced uh, in recovering a vine since this is about the fourth hail storm we've experienced in the last five years. Uh, so they're becoming quite frequent. 
They've all been late October or early November. Growth stages have always been about the same. So, so we, we know pretty much what to expect and how to um, react to the damage. Um, can, you what they, any, can you give us any hints about what you're doing out there? So with a minimal pruned vine compared to a more detailed pruned uh, vine? Well, well our, our, uh, our um, pruning is all mechanical pruning. Um, and we have uh, the majority are uh, hedge pruned, uh, box pruned. Um, to a lesser extent, we have some H pattern where we can we can go through with uh, barrel pruners and um, and have uh, just uh, two sets of cordons uh, for each vine. And there's some minimal pruning or very light pruning techniques. So they're the they're the three main, but uh, most are box pruned. Uh, which makes uh, box pruning gives us the option of fairly easily going in if we want to uh, prune them back after a severe event. But very few people actually do that, uh, do go back and uh, do any sort of pruning. Only in the most severe cases would we go back with a, a barrel pruner uh, to start again or to hedge. Uh, there were some trials done by Bob Emmett following the uh, 2014 um, um, hail event at, uh, that was done at Evoke Vineyards and they looked at very much at going back to square one, pruning back hard, just some hedging or just leaving it and there were some benefits by going back and starting again in very severely damaged uh, vineyards but overall the next year the crop levels were pretty much the same. Um, so our approach here is really, unless it's severely damaged, um, that we, we just generally let the vine um, uh, go its own way. And if there's just moderate damage or less, they're, they're, in many cases, we can retrieve a pretty useful crop uh, in this season. Uh, the complication can be secondary, sec secondary crop, of, mm. of course. And how do you manage that, Ian? The secondary crop, mm. oh, <laughs> it, it it depends on on the varieties. Some some throw lots of secondary uh, secondary crop like gordos and some some of those varieties. Others not so much. So it's a ma balance of of what you do near the end as to um, it, it, if they've ripened sufficiently and the overall um, ripeness of the crop is reduced and just might get picked a bit later. Okay, uh, and just before I let you go, um, in regards to uh, irrigation and nutrition management mm. post frost, mm. is there anything that you do differently compared to a normal season after an event like this? Uh, it, it depends on the severity. Um, we, we, we've seen uh, checked soil moisture monitors after uh, um, after a hail event to severely uh, uh, impacted vines and their water use. Uh, just virtually stops. So, so there's a temptation to go in and um, try and jumpstart jump the vines by putting on lots of water, lots of fertilizer. Well, we've learned that that's not the best way to go, particularly if there's severe damage. You've just got to look at your uh, water monitors. You don't want to flood them and cause uh, water logging at that stage. You don't want piles of toxic potentially toxic uh, nutrients piling up around the roots. Um, as, uh, as uh, Lee said, uh, the damage has been uh, to the top. Foliar feeding is not necessarily any use at that stage. If you lost a vast amount of, uh, of, of canopy. Um, so really our approach is just to be very careful in, in, in starting, let the vine restart by itself. There's no, there's no silver bullet has been said before, make sure there's enough water. And when they start to grow again, then you can start to uh, make use of the uh, root growth that started after the, the shock that the vines had. Can't hear, Robin. <laughs> That old trick, love it. <laughs> Everyone else is doing so well. Um, Alf and Brenton, I'd like to bring you into the conversation as well. Um, 
from from the another inland irrigated region. So, um, Alf, Alf. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> so Alf is the spokesperson. I uh, is this how you're running it? Um, so you uh, did some demonstrations in Murray Valley, uh, looking at different strategies to to ma manage the vines after hail. Um, can you briefly talk us through those? Um, just keeping in mind that we are um, time restricted. Yep. Um, thank you, Robin, and uh, thanks to everyone else that's present today. Uh, yes, in 2014, I'll just clarify again, um, I think he may have got the dates wrong. I think Bob Emmett did some research after our event, which was 2016 on the Darling. Our event happened in October in 2014. So that's when I was involved, and they were on some of my own vineyards and surrounding vineyards that were completely wiped out 90 to 100%. And so you did some um, pruning treatments and you also did some uh, foliar fertilizer applications. Um, what, what, have, what did you learn from those demonstrations that you could um, share with particularly the Riverland growers? Robin, can I just butt in please? Brandon okay. here. Go for it. Okay. My experience with hail damage started back in the 80s in the Riverland, in the late 80s through Loxton and New Residence. So when I when we had this event in Sunraysia, I went straight away to those growers because there was no really information out there available. And I just used my expertise to say that yeah, we should do this and this and this. And every individual property had to be assessed differently and every variety. So I went out and straight away went and pruned within 24 hours some of the vines. And we I'll let our, our, our finished that, but that was our best success. Yeah. So as Brenton has just mentioned, in 2014, October the 22nd at 505, we had the major front come through, especially through the Gold Gold region. And the damage was that excessive in some parts that it's probably very similar to what Lee mentioned in Western Australia, but it was 20 minutes and small hail with a lot of wind velocity. Um, the techniques we took on board going from Brenton's immediate reaction on two vineyards was to, to double prune, to basically prune back the single cordon wire as tight and as efficient and profitable as we could to, to regenerate new growth for the next season. So that was taken on board immediately within three days on a trial panel of uh, probably six vines in one row. And from there, I made the decision to organise and try and, trying to get equipment together, which was a hedge pruner, um, and get that organised. And I looked at the cost. I did a costing on what we had to do. And we then pruned, we're going to prune one vineyard, which is roughly three hectares. And we eventually took on board with Murray Valley and advice from the DPI to do some ground footwork with mapping and along with Brenton and a few others um, to take on four separate areas, one being a control of about two and a half hectares and the other being auxiliars all similar age groups over a different vineyard spread of about three to five kilometres apart. And what were the key results from those demonstrations? Just briefly, yeah. please. So the complete double pruning was a complete success on the vineyard that was damaged 100%. The partial pruning on some of the vineyards from 70 to 80% was shown that it wasn't worth doing, you ought to make a decision that you complete prune and do not try and pick a crop. Uh, where it was like a 70% loss, we tried to recover 30%. We only harvested one 30 tonne V double with excessive mog from that vineyard. So that was part of the trial that proved to us that we should have probably cut it right back or just left it and not tried to pick the crop. And where we, we tipped and skirted some some of the damaged area, it really wasn't worth doing. Like we didn't recover any fruit from that area. 
All right, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Paul and Dylan, can I just ask your um, thoughts on that um, time frame for going through and doing um, the, the pruning, the second pruning? So, um, can, so once you've got some um, lateral growth, uh, and then you go through and prune again. And Lee, I know you've had experience with this as well. Um, uh, from Lee's experience, he said that the vines really struggle to, to push and um, push buds and grow shoots. Can you just um, provide some thoughts on that? Yeah. So the vine has already used a lot of its carbohydrates, a lot of its energy to grow that canopy. We've knocked a whole lot off with the hail. If we let it shoot and come away, it's using more energy, which we're then removing before we the vines then grow away for it effectively for the third the third go for the season. Yeah. Um, so I think that getting on and if you're going to do some of those active management things, the, the sooner you do those, the the better. Yeah. Um, I'm, to me, I suppose the other thing is that the you know as the season progresses, we 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 don't have as much time left for the the canopy to grow and develop. So once again, you want to get on to put quickly, and we're using um, you know other resources, especially water in the profile. And so it can you know if it happens to you know you've got some cover crops and things that are still using water, you can actually end up with the um, the profile quite a lot drier, and that once again inhibits those. Uh, no, I'll, I'll agree with Paul regarding, especially regarding um, the carbohydrate loss and the massive loss of leaf area and the fact that the vines then need to get back into gear and get their hormone balance and figure out what is a dominant shoot tip or how many dominant shoot tips they have um, and don't underestimate the, the, the triple start to the season. Mm, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, now we've got another question. If you decide to cut off a whole cordon to convert to cane pruning the following year, it leaves a very large pruning wound. Do you treat that wound with anything to prevent trunk disease infection? So um, I guess. So I, I phoned a friend. <laughs> uh, I sent Mark Sosnowski a text message about that while we were while, while we were online, Lovely. and he said, "Yes, as it is still raining, we would need to treat those pruning wounds." Yeah, great, excellent. Um, Murray Valley, can I just ask you to mute um, your microphone, please, for the moment? Thank you. And uh, now we've got a. Um, a comment, comment from Len Ibbotson from New Zealand. He said, we tracked hail damaged canes on several two cane VSP blocks after a mod moderately severe hail event that occurred near the start of flowering in spring 2019. Despite severe scarring and pitting to one side of shoots, growers found they were able to wrap canes from these shoots in the following winter. We did not see any obvious problems in the following season relating to retaining the damaged canes. We also trialed spur pruning compared to retaining the damaged canes and saw no obvious advantages, although frost in the second season blurred the results. Thank you, Len, much appreciated. Um, and Cara um, has just asked, what did you treat the wounds with? What would you treat the wounds, treat the wounds with? I'm assuming it's some sort of um, a paint, but um, I'm not going to send another message to Mark. So maybe can we refer that to the, the AWRI help desk unless Thank someone else has a, has a good yeah. answer? So I have spoken to Mark about this exact question um, a, a couple of weeks ago, and um, he suggested that um, some of the powdery mildew products that you're already spraying out into your vineyard at this time do have activity against trunk diseases. So... Um, yeah, if uh, I'll, uh, if you can email the help desk, Cara, and I'll send you some information about what you can use. Um, but definitely those powdery sprays, some of those powdery sprays can be used. I might just chip in there, Robin. I yeah, think let, that, yeah, go for it. Mark's referring to would be tebuconazole. Um, yeah. so, and I know we're not supposed to mention products, but that we used a product called Green Seal for most of our large when we make big pruning cuts. Okay. Um, we paint we paint with Green Seal, but but we do use Tebuconazole through a FMR recycling sprayer as well for trunk disease reduction or management. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you said that. I'm not allowed to use product names, so, <laughs> but you are. <laughs> thank you. Um, now, I would love to hear from Steve Schiller. So Steve, um, as I mentioned in the intro, is very innovative and he um, jumped in to, to help out his fellow growers in the Barossa. Can you talk about um, what you've been doing in the Barossa the last couple of weeks, Steve? Yeah, so we had a, um, I suppose, first off on my own block, I had a young block, um, which we decided to break out all by hand, um, which had lost, looked like it just had the barrel for to go over it. Um, so I also had to do trunks anyway, which was due to happen within a day or two after the hail. Um, so I thought we'll do full shoot removal on that um, and then just try and get better wood for next year and possibly a second crop. Um, my older blocks lost a lot of crop, um, but not too much damage on the wood, luckily. Um, but other friends' blocks that we looked at had a lot of um, wood damage, and they wanted to do a bit of um, removal of the canes. And yeah, we had a bit of a catch up there and talked about well, how can we remove the canes without going through by hand. And I thought, well, we've got a machine in the shed called a grape harvester. Um, which can break things off and thought, well, the, the canes are probably brittle enough to smash it off and thought, well, we can only give it a go. Um, so hooked up, went up there, done about three panels. Um, not many rods broke off, which unfortunately all the new picking heads with the um, bowed rod system aren't aggressive. Um, so back to the workshop, made up a few different picking rods, um, went to like a straight, picking rod which is just a straight stick just above the cordon um, that worked really good just an, as an aggressive whip um, but it come to the point if they were too long then they'd break because they'd get hot um, so yeah tried around with different lengths bending different angles got it working really good um, then after probably 12 hours the canes become quite rubbery and this was probably five days after the hail event and they wouldn't wouldn't snap so there was obviously a change in the in the vine that toughened them up and yeah it became quite a ratty job and then we we pulled the pin so sort of have it was probably something you've got one or two days to get over the emotions of it um in the second or third day you've got to work out what you're going to do and if you haven't done what you want to do like lee was saying too i reckon by the fifth or sixth day you might as well not worry because the vines are starting to push out and one thing probably that yeah found with playing around always a lot doing lots of different innovation stuff and that was a really good mental health for me and for friends too just playing around with different things and trying to save the solve problems and i don't know if we'll yeah if we'll get anything out of it but yeah certainly done the job of removing the sheets. So it'll be interesting to see what happens later on. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, it sounds um, everyone's got a very similar message. If you're going to do anything, go in early. Um, and if you leave it too late, then there's uh, arguably no, no point. It's just uh, making you feel better perhaps. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Does anyone have any? Oh, sorry, we've got one more question. Uh, for light, light to mid hail damaged vines, you have mentioned not using foliar high in nitrogen, but thoughts on using foliar high in micronutrition, particularly boron and magnesium to help with wounds and general overall bunch health. Um, can I give this one to? Uh, <laughs> so, Ian, have you got any experience with these sorts of um, fertilisers? Robin? Yes. Oh, Brenton here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same as anybody as a human being, when we get sick, we take vitamins. Same with the vine to take out some of that stress. One of the main reasons um, I've, I've pushed this product of zinc, because zinc is one of those factors that take out the stress of the plant. Certainly the things like um, magnesium, if it's really hot, but really what you've got to do is make sure, and that's where the products like the sea soles and the 
that sort of come into practice that it gives the, the plant some autumn and cytokine to really recover. Okay, yeah. thank you. Ian? The, the zinc has often been associated with um, a recovery of uh, stressful um, things like frost and hail. And a lot of people do that just as a matter of course here. I've not seen the real evidence uh, of any of these sort of treatments, um, but we do need to be uh, make sure that uh, that uh, if the uh, function of the roots has been impaired in any way, um, that uh, foliar feeding uh, does um, get the nutrients directly into the vine um, to overcome that difficulty in get, extracting it from the soil. The, the same amount is still in the soil, uh, but we just need to get it into the vines straight after. So, so that would be uh, our advice. Generally, is to give them some of these uh, some of these micronutrients after after damage. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and Paul, um, Dylan, Lee, or um, Chris, have you guys had experience with these foliar fertilizers? And what are your thoughts uh, on applying them after hail? Who's first? Can, can you hear me okay? Can hear you, we can't see. Yeah, yeah I'm having IT troubles here. Okay. Um, yeah, look, I, I agree with all those comments. I think it's it's really important probably to actually understand the background nutrition of the vineyard originally, um, in terms of if you've got parcel and petiole tests and you know the site and the kind of attributes that would relate to the nutrition of that vine in any normal season. And look, some of those products can work, but I, I I caution, I'll say this, sometimes there's some big promises. And, you know, for a quick example, if people put on a lot of nutrient in their spray tank, if they're not getting really good coverage, well, they're more importantly, they're actually getting a lot of off-target drift. Um, and you've got to remember the uptake of this. Some of these compounds is not as great as what we might think. So they're not like just popping a medicine and suddenly everything's fixed. So I think this has to be realistic about what they can achieve. Certainly the... The, the you know the foliar kelp seem to work quite well but we've got to remember one or two is not going to be a fix all either so it, it's you, know, you really need to get some very unbiased expert advice and know the background of the vineyard okay wonderful yes ian just one more comment um uh, one of the things and and, and that was very uh, very uh, silent words from chris is that we have to be careful not to uh to invest in things that are, are not guaranteed to give us a return. A lot of our growers this year are, are going to be very financially hard hit uh, b uh, by this storm and with projected uh, decreases in red, red wine grapes uh, for this year. We have to look at now uh, how to manage costs as much as anything. So I would never suggest uh, going to to uh, 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 to growers to apply anything that is not guaranteed of contributing to to the health and well-being and and uh, performance of the vines next year. So, might might make you feel good by putting on you know, some of these expensive uh, 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 so-called remedies uh, to, to to this sort of damage, but um, we wouldn't be promoting anything that didn't have absolute uh, benefit, proven benefit to the vines in aiding their recovery. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, we have run out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, everyone, all of our panellists for joining us today and, and those panellists that gave presentations. It's uh, much appreciated. Um, and I'd just like to share, um, again, I know Chris did put this information up in his PowerPoint presentation, but here are the details um, for the storm recovery that PERSA is offering. So this information will be emailed out to you with the webinar recording, uh, but please use these services if, if you need. Um, it's really such a privilege to work in an industry where um, the 
individuals within the industry are just so willing to um, support other growers, particularly during these um, events. So uh, I'd really like to thank everyone that has contributed to this webinar. It's really, really great to see you all um, stepping up and providing that support and sharing your learning. So thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank all the um, participants who have joined. It's always great to have you and your questions. And as we said at the start, this webinar was recorded. So we will send out that recording for you. Uh, so our next uh, webinar will be on next Wednesday, and it's about new findings and implications of latest phylloxera research. So um, that one's not to be missed as well. So thank you again, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you.